Hi, dear members and uh, friends of the European um, Defense Network. We are here in Munich at uh, Airbus Urban Mobility and we are glad to be welcomed by Maxi Myers, who is uh, from the Strategy and Programs Department and uh, who will uh, give us uh, some insights about uh, what's happening at Airbus in terms of these uh, new aircrafts that you all know. And we will get to know more also about the European uh, dimension of um, uh, mobility at Airbus and also about possible uh, defense uh, topics. And I think this is something that uh, is also relevant and maybe not that much highlighted uh, in the recent debate. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Maxime. You joined um, Airbus August in last year. And before that, uh, you used to be a strategy consultant at a Starburst. And uh, you own two master's degrees. Uh, one from the University of Michigan, one from a called Polytechnique, so you're really a tech geek. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. Uh, aerospace uh, fan, uh, born and raised. <laughs> born and raised, and you're also a holder, proud holder of a private pi uh, pilot license. Yeah. So I guess you have uh, one laughing eye, maybe one sad uh, or, or crying eye concerning the idea that these assets might get autonomous one day. Uh, but we will come back to that uh, point uh, maybe later on. And uh, yeah, we'd like to just start with the vision of um, urban air mobility at Airbus. So could you just give us a brief introduction into what projects Airbus is working on in that, on that, dom in that domain? So uh, sure, Peter, yeah. Um, Airbus uh, urban air mobility vision is to create a service uh, for citizens and for cities, uh, which is a mobility service in cities uh, leveraging a new type of vehicles, which are called EVTOLs, electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. But this end-to-end uh, -end service is so much more than the vehicle. It's also uh, how you integrate them to um, the public uh, transport network in cities, metro, uh, S-Bahn, etc. How you um, coordinate the flights and make sure that uh, those aircraft uh, remain um, distant from one another in the skies. So that's the whole discipline of unmanned uh, traffic management. Uh, and uh, our vision in the end, um, from our current uh, knowledge and also with partners, is to create this end-to-end uh, -end service. Could you give us also some insights on the current um, political, social and uh, legal challenges that you are facing with the project? So, uh, so far, the political, um, on the political side, uh, it's been great. We are uh, duly supported by uh, members of parliaments in uh, Airbus home countries, uh, so respectively uh, the UK, Spain, uh, France and Germany, um, so for the domain four. Um, then, when it will come later, of course, to introduce those vehicles to market, uh, we'll have to uh, of course, um, like tackle uh, issues such as noise, such as like general public ad, uh, acceptance and willingness to, uh, to to get onto into these kind of uh, services into into this um, so into those vehicles. Uh, but we think it's it'll be like any new technology. It'll be maybe first uh, like a bit expensive, but then as usage gets like democratized. Uh, we'll be able to uh, more and more like decrease the ticket price and boost uh, public acceptance. Uh, yeah. Okay, very good. Um, yeah, you, as you mentioned, um, uh, Airbus is a multinational company with uh, four big uh, home countries in Europe. And um, can you give us an idea about how European, for example, the City Airbus project uh, is in fact uh, beginning let's say with the research and development, the production, also further management um, uh, departments and tasks. So, yeah, sure, the, the city Airbus uh, demonstrator, as you, as you see here, was uh, assembled and built in Donauwert with uh, Airbus Helicopters uh, Germany. Uh, but there are like many components and many um, suppliers that were on board that are European and at, um, let's say, uh, our organization is the reflection of uh, how European Airbus is. Uh, we have, for example, uh, members the, the, uh, that are sitting in Toulouse. We have members of our unmanned traffic management team that are in Madrid. Uh, we've had contribution, for example, on this vehicle from a team that also sits in Toulouse uh, from Airbus Defense and Space. 
Uh, we are based here in, in Munich, even though uh, the, the, the engineering development and the assembly was made in, in Donauwerth. So it's really a, a, a pan-European uh, project. And as for any Airbus program, we're leveraging competencies that we have uh, all around the group. Uh, we have, for example, uh, experts in, 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 uh, in, just to name a few, in structures in Spain. We have wing experts uh, and like aero structures also in, in the UK. Um, so, yeah, it's really a European project. Nice. Uh, glad to hear that. So, in, as you know, European Defense Network is also a very European association and newly founded. And uh, for us, uh, especially, it's also a question how uh, Europe can contribute to these projects to succeed in the end. And um, concerning that, how do European institutions help uh, to make these projects a success? Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about, for example, the EASA on, on the certification side. Can you give yeah. us some uh, insights on that, maybe? Sure. So, uh, first, it's uh, Im important to remind what's the value proposition of, of those vehicles. Wh wh why do we make eVTOLs? So, we think uh, eVTOLs, uh, first of all, bring a new source of, of propulsion, which is actually more sustainable than uh, uh, carbon-based aviation. So, that's why we are investigating the topic. We also think that with this new form of energy, we can bring the cost per flight hour uh, down, uh, but also inherently you see they have like several propellers. We think that with uh, also leveraging uh, distributed propulsion correctly, we can make those vehicles more safe. Uh, or um, let's say that the safety concept uh, can be like uh, can be very po very positive in the end. And that uh, here in addressing this last point, of course a connection with the regulator. Uh, so in Europe it's uh, IASA. Uh, um, this connection is key and we are obviously working with uh, IASA, we, we exchange on what we learn from uh, those two demonstrators, so the city Airbus and, uh, and Vahana, uh, and, and, and help them actually shape the standards, see uh, so that they learn uh, also from industry uh, how we plan to show that uh, a component, uh, let's say a battery for example, is, uh, is safe and they listen to us. We uh, kind of discuss which test can be shown because everything is kind of with the, if you bring a new electric drive train for example there's a lot of new standards to write and yaza on, on on this side is actually very very impressive and is uh, at the forefront in like engaging with uh, with um, the several industrial partners that develop those vehicles uh, learning from them and like shaping the standards uh, and actually worldwide yeah Great to hear that from you. So I, what I hear is that uh, you really see a value in, um, the, let's say, the leadership that the EASA takes in that term, uh, technically wise, and also uh, yeah, preparing the path for Airbus, I guess. And uh, also think one key, as you said, is the cooperation that you work really also on a knowledge and technical base together with them and not uh, against each other, but uh, uh, the European Union and the EASA basically is an integral, integral part of institutions from uh, the European Union um, can really contribute and put yeah, value in this project. Yeah, yeah this, is, this is really valued uh, and we know that there is absolutely uh, no uh, use case, no application or business if those vehicles are not safe. So first of all, and that was actually, we learned a lot from demonstrators uh, and in order like to, in the future, make a product that is safe. And that's yeah. the, the first step. Talking about the European uh, mindset, what do you think, apart maybe from, let's say, the regulatory questions um, concerning maybe also us, uh, our members and also interests concerning um, yeah, our European mindset and culture, what do you think, uh, how can uh, European mindset help such big projects uh, that really uh, encompass a lot of players uh, worldwide and also especially in Europe, how can it help um, to yeah, get um, to, uh, to achieve all your goals. Uh, you yourself, you are quite a European uh, young professional. You studied um, also in the US, in, in France. Now you're working in Germany. What do you think? How can this European mindset uh, help a big European project to succeed? So this European mindset is, is, is really key, as, as you highlighted. And beyond uh, just our, our, let's say, natural uh, presence in, in our home countries, uh, we went a step beyond, and Airbus is currently leading an, an initiative, which is the EIP-SEC, so the European uh, Innovation Project 
for uh, smart communities, smart citizen communities, I believe, that's the name. And so there, uh, I think 42 cities in Europe are members of this, this initiative. And there, we are really gathering um, what cities want. We let communities uh, speak first. Uh, and, and this all over Europe. Do they want this technology first for logistics? Do they want it for emergency applications, passengers? We build roadmaps. We, we, uh, we, we, we of course, give feedback on like, uh, what this technology can do. And, and when it will be available, uh, and the barriers to entry, the necessary, for example, investment in infrastructure, and how cities are willing to, to partner on that side. And so this, this initiative uh, has, be, uh, uh, has been key, because the requirements in the end come comes from citizens, come from communities. Uh, and, and otherwise, the first step, safety. And, and of course, the, the immediate step after that is to have those vehicles welcome and and start on use cases that serve communities. Talking about use cases, um, I would like to transfer also to one topic that's uh, important for the European Defence Network. Of course, is the defence and security um, that we are also um, working on, all of us um, in, in different uh, dimensions. And concerning that, uh, what use cases actually are already addressed and uh, identified uh, by Airbus maybe, or also maybe uh, in other uh, companies? Could you give us, uh, at that stage, maybe a small insight concerning these military or defense uh, use cases? Yeah, sure. So, uh, of course, like there's, there can be many applications to, to this technology. Defense applications are, are one of them. And, uh, and with this, uh, we are, like, of course, keeping the door open and discussing with Airbus Defense and Space. Airbus Defense and Space has the dialogue with uh, our home country, uh, country's defense organizations. And even though our priority is to develop a commercial service for uh, communities uh, in, in, in Europe and in the world, uh, then yes, there are use cases such as uh, on the battlefield, uh, troop resupply that are foreseen for, for, for those vehicles. Maybe later actually uh, passenger carrying uh, missions such as uh, search and rescue, but that's really technology permitting and, and, uh, and we need of course, the, the, the military customer, from what I know, has uh, requirements that are, that are well defined. And uh, we, we understand that, for example, um, electrification is good, but autonomy is a very important one. Because if, if the value proposition now becomes not to expose the human life of a pilot, and uh, starting with the logistics, you know, you, you clearly have like value if you're between your, your convoy, uh, like uh, let's say that needs to three days to reach uh, a platoon or a squad, needs to be protected. Uh, you between this and you between your, your cargo helicopters that also need to be protected is uh, vulnerable. So if in the end you have an uh, autonomous cargo drone uh, that, that can do this mission at, at a lower cost, then of course that has value. And I'm not saying those vehicles the demonstrators we made and, and probably our, our future product aim first for this commercial mission. They w we want to fly them in cities. And some aspects can be reused about maybe electric powertrains, around distributed propulsion, but, but it'll probably be like another vehicle or a derivative. And also technology permitting, we, we need to assess the time frame for, for this use case. But it's very promising for sure. Yeah, very interesting to hear that from you. I think this is a topic which is uh, also relevant, uh, but not that highlighted uh, at the moment. So uh, good to start a discussion about that here. And I guess also the color maybe of uh, the demonstrators would then also maybe change to a light green or <laughs> dep yeah. depending um, other colors. Yeah, good to, to hear that, that uh, also these, um, that these scenarios are also relevant for Airbus. And I guess uh, we will, we will uh, realize in the near future what, uh, what can be done here because also here the technological progress uh, won't make uh, a break, but uh, we'll continue also uh, taking advantage of such technology. And we'll yeah. so also see what other players will be doing. So really, I think good uh, to start this also this discussion here. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, if you look uh, further down the road, uh, what is a scenario maybe um, in the defense sector, also in the, in the civilian branch, uh, which is of course your main focus at the moment, where would you like to see uh, these assets maybe in the year 2030 plus? So uh, what, what is your, also as a private pilot, your, your scenario that you would like to see? Um, I think the 
promise. Uh, I think those vehicles can address a, a lot of, uh, um, say, societal concerns about aviation being more sustainable. And I think we need to be very pragmatic. It's starting at, at, at this scale is actually good. And if we can, uh, along with uh, bringing like a vehicle that has less uh, environmental impact, a vehicle that brings uh, a cheaper cost per flight hour, uh, we can uh, gradually like uh, expand uh, the, the, the number of, of, uh, of people that can travel. Uh, and then there's like, it's very interesting because beyond just uh, time savings and cities, there's, there's a clear value, which is we would call like the enjoyment of flight. And uh, I think this one is, uh, is, uh, is, is really good to pursue. So if, if down the road, uh, 20, 30 uh, plus uh, technology permitting, we have like uh, a vehicle that becomes uh, cheaper and cheaper that uh, more people can fly and beyond uh, just like doing like a, a ride in a city or going from point A to point B, just enjoy a sightseeing flight. And if we can make that affordable, I think that would be great. I guess there will be a lot of work to do also to, um, also in terms of communication to, um, to reach the acceptance, but uh, this is a challenge that I'm sure Airbus is uh, capable uh, to achieve. And um, basically we are starting also doing this um, communication terms here with, with you. So we are glad that Airbus uh, accepted uh, us as an interview partner here. And uh, we are really, really lucky to, to have uh, you as a young professional here uh, welcoming us and uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, I'm sure that this won't be the last time that uh, our interests and friends will see us uh, with new formats in the near future. And uh, we will, uh, of course, as the European Defense Network, stay in touch uh, on these topics and uh, also with you. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you very much. Yeah.